Robinson and uh, anyone from Britain. I always think Tommy Robinson. He 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 does seem like he <laughs> could just kind of flip <laughs> the way he talks and the the kind of frantic way in which he. I mean, I'd 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 had a cordial relationship with Tommy for some time. Uh, his mum didn't live too far from where I live. Um, mm. Today we'll be discussing the Grant Walker's comment in depth today regarding Stephen Yaxley Lennon aka Tommy Robinson. He'll be centering on his past and dispelling myths which are all too common in the Tommy movement. Take a moment and read the comment. Fasten your seatbelts because this one will reveal information from a neighbour of Mr Yaxley Lennon which will tell us what he was actually about prior to his EDL days and his street movement days is not going to paint a pretty picture, that's for sure. The myth that he was some sort of mini Richard Branson in Luton will be shattered irrevocably. It goes without saying, I don't agree with Grant Walker's comment at all. This narrative styling Mr Robinson as a successful businessman in Luton is not going to be bought. Not by us, at the very least. It's obviously dubious, that's to say the least. We'll be playing a recording from an Asian man who was an acquaintance or even friend of Mr. Robinson, as well as a neighbour of Mr. Robinson, before he became infamous. That's going to go a long way in disproving the sugar-coated narrative that Tommy fans have been fed over the years, thus demonstrating once again that this... This place is the go-to place when it comes to myth-busting around Mr. Robinson. But before we do all that, let's apply some common sense to proceedings, shall we? Mr. Robinson had very few prospects considering he had a criminal record. Yes, a criminal record. He's said to have lost his job that he trained for as an apprentice due to a criminal conviction. That puts paid to the idea that he had a successful career in engineering prior to the EDL days. That says goodbye to that particular myth, because that myth is out there amongst Tommy fans. As you can imagine, with a criminal record, his employment prospects would be bleak. They were bleak back in those days. That may have been the stimulus to get him involved in the tanning business and the alleged drug dealing with Asian lads in Luton. Yes, you heard that right. We'll be showing the receipts for that allegation from his ex-neighbour. Now, tanning shops are notorious fronts for criminal activity, especially when it comes to the narcotics trade. If you don't believe us, just Google tanning shop um, drugs and you'll see a number of instances where tanning shops are being used as fronts for criminal activity in the narcotics industry. We're not saying anything categorical here right now, but clearly the fella is not an upstanding or successful bloke that some of his devotees make out. Here's one of Mr. Robinson's ex-neighbours, Mr. Hussein, spilling the beans on Mr. Robinson's early life. Here you go. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd had a cordial relationship with Tommy for some time. Uh, his mum didn't live too far from where I live. Um, <laughs> Kidding. And the more and more I spoke to him, right, um, I realised a lot of his hatred was not necessarily for Islam and Muslims, it was more to do with some of his personal experiences he had with some of the brothers in Luton <laughs> in a particular lifestyle and career path he chose before he got into tanning. Um, and <laughs> I genuinely... What was that, drug dealing? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, he was into all that. Yeah. And, and, and he, he faced some uh, thulm from the, the brothers on the road uh, in Luton. But, I, but when, when I spoke to him, it, he didn't seem like an ideological hate of Islam and Muslims. Mm. He didn't seem like that kind of guy. He just seemed like he hated... You know what I mean, yeah? <laughs> he could turn. But I think his personal experience with local Lutonians, that's what turned him. Yeah. So say goodbye to the myth that Mr. Robinson was some sort of upstanding businessman in the community. A pillar of the community, not. He was hardly Luton's diminutive version of Richard Branson. It's got to be stressed, we absolutely despise folks who deal in narcotics. No true patriot would ever do that. Not only do dealers supply poison to young Brits, but they also get them hooked on it so it ruins their lives, rendering them homeless or 
put out to work on the streets if they're females. So Mr. Robinson has that on his conscience. Dealers are the ones more likely to be involved in trafficking and pimping British women around the country. Mr. Robinson may well have been rubbing shoulders with groomers in Luton back in those days. In reality, you don't even need this information to suspect or be dubious about Mr. Robinson's narrative that he was some sort of success before he turned to the EDL and Zio Schilling with uh, Brian of Tel Aviv, Ezra and Co. If Mr. Robinson had these prospects and was doing successfully according to the sugar-coated narrative, he would hardly have got himself involved in a street movement known for violence and full of undesirable folks, frauds like Don and Becker, criminals and uh, now a number of convicted nonces. I would not get involved in that crowd, no normal person with prospects and life plans would. The fact that Mr. Robinson has a short fuse and is a hothead even now, even today, as a father and a man in middle age, it suggests to me that he was even worse in his younger days. He's notoriously unreliable and unpredictable to boot, no showing for events and letting people who were relying on him down. So in the next 12 months, whilst you're moaning about me, in the next 12 months, I'm going to publish four blockbuster documentaries. Same applies to the six documentaries that he said that he was going to put out this year. The year is drawing to an end now. We're in, we're almost in October and we've seen zero documentaries from him. Oh, but I don't like being inactive. So in that six to eight weeks from my court case, I thought I'd publish my other documentary, which is about a British man called Yisrael Shalom. Same applies to the Shalom documentary, which he promised would be out before the general election in December, which I believe, going from memory, was the 12th of December, 2019. It's nowhere to be seen, and this year, 2020, is almost over. And this is all despite him saying it's about his mate, Mr. Shalom, and he's the only person out there to get his story out. OK, now this documentary tells his story, because one of the last people he messaged before he died was me, relying on me as a friend to tell his story and highlight... If he can't even be disciplined enough for his deceased mate as a middle-aged man, how undisciplined and unruly do you think he was back in his younger days? Same applies to him being unable to stay out of violence and honour his promises as a middle-aged man. He can't do that right now. What do you think he was like as a young testosterone-filled man? The Luton Zuckerberg? You're having a laugh. I'm more inclined to believe that he was Luton's local dealer, not car dealer according to his family friend, a different type of dealer. No matter where I've gone in the world, I score. I'll show you tonight. As soon as we get in this pub, I'll, I'm going to record it for you. I've gone to... I've gone to Qatar pub, I've gone to Doha, the school gear of the sesh, while they're all praying. I've gone everywhere, mate, everywhere. Every city I've gone to, when we went to Germany for the World Cup, I was like, see you later, lads, where are you going? I'm going to find out, and then that's it, we're on. So Even as a middle-aged man, a father, he's purchasing this type of material now, so he's still supporting dealers. No patriot would ever purchase. No patriot would ever purchase that material because that material and those dealers are ruining the lives of Brits. Whenever you drive around at night in a town centre or as, um, a city centre and you see um, ladies walking up and down the street um, soliciting themselves, that is the product of dealers and folks purchasing narcotics. So when I, if I, the next time you see that, you need to think that is Mr. Robinson's doing. In part. What? What is? Th what the fuck? You people that are giving these lot money. Do you not stop and think where your money's going? Serious? Because they're walking around with Stone Island clobber on, five hundred pound jackets, hundred pound woolly hats, with the Stone Island badge on or whatever else. <laughs> I mean, these people. This is a scam. This is a pyramid scheme. Let me explain why his dress sense is important and is something that people with high levels of discernment would pick up on. If he was well dressed back in his EDL days, then given the information that we've heard, his clobber may well have been paid for by dealing in narcotics crime. 
He may well have developed this penchant and love for designer gear from his days as a criminal dealer. Why should you continue to feed his desire for designer gear through your donations? Ask yourself that question. His clothes are important because there's a number of folks out there who are clearly worried that their donation money is being used to fund his lifestyle. At the moment he's crowdfunding or, or asking for donations at the moment because of this, because of that. Um, I heard the man's got three or four houses. It's, we should be worried about them. We shouldn't be worried about the uh, the celebs of the movement. Like, what are the, what are we getting out of it? A couple of yeah. stupid videos. So, so the money and these these what what the, the money is not coming from Ezra Levant and from elsewhere. The money that they're sort of spending on coke that is coming from like working class people's donations. Yeah, is I think that's how it works. I think a large portion of it is yeah. Not only this, there's a veteran who came out and said that he will not donate to Tommy anymore and he suspects Tommy's spending the cash on the finer things in life. You can have a read of the veteran Joe Mason's comments. They were screenshot. Have a read of those, they are quite telling. Remember, there's also the issue of sensitivity here. He's turning up wearing clothes that cost more than some of his supporters earn in a year. That strikes of insensitivity to me. Lastly, let's zone in on this claim that uh, Mr. Robinson's remaining supporters are all on the dole or on pensions. Nobody here ever said that. Okay, let's repeat that. So that's a false claim. What we do know though is there's a massive level of unemployment amongst people who go to demos. One demo goer, a regular demo goer, estimated 40% of those who go to demos are unemployed. Um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I probably would say something like that, um, John Smith. Um, it, it, it's certainly not a small percentage. If that anecdotal figure is true, then we can extrapolate and apply that on to Mr. Robinson's supporters, meaning nearly half of Mr. Robinson's supporters are unemployed, making our work or proving our work to be even more vital in helping these people save as much money and time as they can so they can self-improve rather than spend their time chanting Mr. Robinson's name having travelled for hours and donated money to a man who is far richer than they will ever become. This is another testament to the fact that this ministry helps people go free, helps people rebuild their self-esteem, their destroyed self-esteem and it develops their minds and increases their levels of discernment.